I need protection. The landlords need it. And they're willing to pay it. You can see what happens if they don't pay it. People are not willing to talk about it. People aren't willing to give evidence. What are you doing with ruthless people? These people are prepared to kill to protect their illegal business sources. These people need putting in the same box as my brother was put in. Well, I'm Mick Baxendale and I'm the manager licensee of the Niche Nightclub. Four hours after giving this interview, Mick Baxendale was dead. Protection racketeering, extorting money from people through intimidation, is one of the most widespread and corrosive forms of organized crime. It's extremely difficult to stamp out. Its victims are too terrified to talk. In this program, how the racketeers got one city, Manchester, in their grip. And who's behind the thuggery? Manchester's nightlife is legendary, but gangland violence threatens its future. Now, the Canal Street gay village is the centre of activity, but it's buzzing here because the great all-night rave clubs, like the Hacienda, have been killed by gangs. There are thousands and thousands of people going out in Manchester every weekend on Canal Street. On the surface, it looks as though Manchester has never been busier, never been more popular, never been more successful. However, you have to acknowledge the difference between um, discotheques and nightclubs and bars. What made Manchester famous was the Hacienda nightclub. What came out of that was an entire music scene, which we now call the Manchester music scene, which made Man put Manchester on the international map. Clubland has always attracted gangsters. There's money to be made. Money from extortion and money from drugs. Big money. Supplying those drugs to the ravers that arrived in Manchester in 1988 and 89 from all over the country made a lot of gangsters um, millionaires. It's as simple as that. If you're supplying a nightclub, the easiest way to protect your territory is to make sure that the bouncers on the door are friendly to your interests. City centre bouncers are now regulated and registered. But in the 1980s, gangs fought and won a war to control the doors. Now, the victors of that war have extended their power across Manchester and other northern cities. There were three main groupings. Cheatham Hill, known locally as The Hill. Two main formings in uh, Moss Side called The Gooch and Doddington. Um, named after two streets in Moss Side, one on the west side, one on the east side. And then the Salford, which is split mainly along family lines, though they'll group together when and if it's necessary. As Manchester's clubs soared to national and international fame, these gangs buzzed around their new honeypot. The bigger the name, the bigger the target. The Hacienda created the phenomenon of Manchester, a thriving music and club scene. But the Hacienda lost control of its door to possibly the most powerful gang in Manchester, the Salford. From then on, it was doomed. The Hacienda is closing its doors as of today. This place is coming like a ghost town. The closure of Manchester's clubs didn't mean the end of the Salford gang, just new targets for their bully boys. They turned their muscle on the city's pubs. The Salford gang consists of loose-knit groups of thugs who operate their own territories in the city. They pay their dues to the Salford leadership and use this gang affiliation to impose their so-called security services on landlords. I met two doormen, who, for obvious reasons, agreed to speak to me only under the guarantee of anonymity. They explained how the system works. 
we work for these people, then people know who they are, or they've heard of them, and it frightens them away. Because they're fucking big boys, you know what I mean, the big time. We're just the middlemen for them. We get 30 quid a night, yeah? Landlord pays 60. I collect the money, take it down to him, pay the lads out, give him what he, what he gets. He gets other 30 pound off each man, you see. He's got like 200 lads working for him. More than 300 Manchester pubs have been closed or burnt out in recent years. How many through extortion? There are no statistics, and neither breweries nor landlords are willing to discuss the issue of the racketeers. The landlord's going to save more money paying us than he is going to have to refurbish his business because it's been wrecked. So they're going to pay you that much. We don't like people trying to muscle in on our door. We don't have any of that. We get people coming to the pubs that we run because um, they want to take over. They want the money, don't they? They want it for their business. Uh, but we're not allowing it. It's our business, isn't it? We want the money. They turn against us. Kick arms, don't we? As <laughs> simple as that. These pubs that have shut down, there's quite a few. And that's just because they're not willing to pay for doorman or protection money. So people just gone in, trashed the pub, petrol bombed it, and it's just cost them so much money to get it right. When all they need is to get a few doormen pay something up to 50 quid. Problem solved. We've put them out of business, they've lost a lot of money. It's not just publicans. Any shopkeeper can find himself in need of security from people with gang connections. Neighbourhood corner grocery stores, often owned by Asian families, are particularly vulnerable. Packies of targets. There's a Packies standard shop near us, big supermarket. They had a bit of trouble a couple of weeks ago. We went down that side out. They got on the wrong, wrong side end of it. Somebody. They thought they could take it themselves, but obviously not and the shop got blew out. Well, that's what you're looking at if they don't pay. They've got to live over that shop. He's already moved once through, like, people want protection off him. So, he's got kids upstairs and all that lot. He doesn't want to do five on, simple as that. And now, he's happy. He's happy little packy. <laughs> and that's what he is. Now he's paying me, say, £30 a week, £40 a week. I've got easy money again. But that's for me, that's my own money. I don't have to part with that with the big one. In Salford, the big one, the man alleged to be behind the city's protection rackets, is widely known, though few will name him publicly. It took four days of rioting in Ordsall, in which shots were fired at police to flush him out. Local councillor, the late Joe Burrows, told newspapers that a man named Paul Massey was the Mr. Big behind Salford's gangsters. Massey went on television to deny the charge, accusing the police themselves of provoking the riots. Plenty of people who've had their doors kicked in and dragged out and had an Audi search and never been in trouble with the police. Have you protested to the police? We've protested, we've put complaints in all over, everyone else has put complaints in all over. It's all whitewashed by the police. Although suspected of heavy involvement in organised crime, Massey always strenuously denied this. Indeed, he had only been convicted for fraud. But while Massey portrays himself as a spokesman for the community, policemen who've investigated him paint a different picture. He frequently pops up, portraying himself as some sort of Robin Hood. And this, this isn't the case. This isn't the case. It's far more sinister. He's certainly been behind a great number of um, incidents. He's becoming difficult to prosecute because he's able now, having established many enterprises in the city, to stand back from obvious hands-on involvement and therefore he will be very difficult to link to um, particular events. With family connections to PMS, one of Salford's most prominent security companies, Massey is a well-established local figure. But such is the aura of fear that surrounds him and his henchmen 
that few people, if any in Salford, will give evidence against him. I think the consequences of trying to give evidence against um, Paul Massey could have very severe repercussions for anybody that was minded to do so. Five years ago, Massey was accused of organising a night of violence at Manchester's plush Piccadilly 21 Club. Two innocent bystanders were stabbed. Massey and eight others were arrested. A dozen witnesses told the police what had happened. But when the case came to trial, not one of them was willing to take the stand. Massey and his associates walked free from court and posed for the photographers. Getting evidence, getting somebody to stand up in court and say that man did this is very, very difficult. And the circumstances today of uh, the way people are prosecuted make it nigh impossible. It's very sad, but that's the truth. Now behave yourselves, or else otherwise you will see Massey stop completely. These scenes erupted when fans of Salford boxer Steve Foster battled with supporters of his opponent outside the ring at Birmingham's NEC. Paul Massey was among those arrested in the aftermath of the fighting. Eleven men admitted their part in the violence and were sentenced. But Massey was acquitted. Massey's arrogance appears to know no bounds. He was even accused of threatening to kill policemen who stopped him for drink driving. Finally, on a July night, outside the Beaten Track pub in Manchester, Massey's taste for violence caught up with him. In a confrontation with stagnite revellers, he stabbed a man in the groin and left him for dead. But this time, Massey had blundered. His attack had been witnessed by a policeman while Confederates obstructed the police, Massey took his chance and fled. In part two, while their leader was on the run, how the Salford gang took extortion onto the streets.